You are listening to the Final Say Radio Show, a Rappaport Media production, with your host Brett Rappaport and co-host John Rappaport. Anyway, actually, I, I think we have our guest uh, on the line right now. I'm going to bring him in. And uh, Congressman, is that you? It is. How are you today, Britt? Hi. Welcome. I just noticed you on the call. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, we have Congressman Phil Rowe with us, and uh, it's a pleasure to have you. And first, I want to wish you a a happy July 4th, happy birthday to our beloved country. And I'm sure you know I follow all of your op-eds and and your press releases and things of that nature, and I really appreciated the kind and thoughtful words that you uh, put out on uh, recognizing our nation's birthday. Well, Brett, thank you. We use that here in uh, East Tennessee. We we really go all out. We um, we build a, a, a couple of floats, and uh, we're in seven parades over the Fourth of July, on, and then during that week. And uh, the last one, I got to drive a 1948 Farmall tractor. So it was, I usually walk them and shake a lot of hands, and I knew I was out of shape because my right forearm was sore the day after the Fifth of July. I shook so many hands, but. We really do take it seriously, and, and it's it's such a uh, a great place where I live in Northeast Tennessee to to see the people celebrate and kids are out and and learning about what what that Fourth of July really means. Yeah, well, I did something a little differently this year. I took my uh, my fiance and we went to Philadelphia and uh, stayed there for a few days, and and we actually stayed right on the corner of uh, where Independence Hall is, and we had a fantastic time. And I I enjoyed it so much. I want to take the kids there next year and, and try to make it a tradition because it, it was fantastic. That is a uh, that's a trip that Brett that everybody ought to make. It is, and to realize that little that little small building is not that big, where those uh, men got together and put together uh, this constitution and um, that that we that we so cherish. It, it's really amazing when I stood there and looked in there and thought, how in the world. In that short a time, we can't even do a farm bill in that length of time, and they wrote an entire book on how you run a country. Well, you know what the problem is that you know our Constitution is you know on a, on a big document it's one page, but in a, in a little small book it's you know anywhere from fifteen to twenty pages depending on which copy you have. And these bills, it seems like they can't make one anymore that's not a thousand pages. And, and of course, half the pages are references to prior law, so you have to go back and read what that law said to make to make sense of it all. It's almost uh, that was what was maddening for me about reading the health care bill was that when it references back to the IRS code, it references back to HHS um, uh, codes, and it it takes it is a chore to read. Doesn't people think when you read these bills that it that it's like reading a novel? It's not. It it's it is very difficult, and you have to have two or three different books to be able to read it to actually know what the bill says. That's right. Now, Congressman, we had a very unusual circumstance this year on July 4th because I was in Philadelphia, but John was in Paris. And I want to welcome John to the conversation. John, you there? Yeah, I'm sorry. I was just coming off mute. Uh, Hello, Congressman. Yeah, I was in Paris. It was the first time ever that I was out of the country for Fourth of July, which is always a great holiday because it's sort of a you know it's a it's kind of a sober moment and not just having a good time with family to but reflect on how important things are. And of course, being in France is interesting because we, as as much as there's been tension back and forth, and we pick on the French from time to time, they're not they you know we we tease them sometimes about having tanks that have you know one one gear forward and two in reverse. But at the end of the day, you know we have to remember that America would not be here but for the French. We would almost certainly have been. Uh, I, I I believe that virtually all of the founding fathers would have ultimately been hunted down and either killed or served life sentence in prison um and that you know if if not for the french and of course what really struck me on this trip was and and I left the day before uh Bastille uh day and what struck me is how both the US and the french are still in a fierce battle with very similar percentages in the populations for the very own liberty that we thought we won all those years ago, kind of a sad irony. It is, and uh, and, and just to let you know, I had uh, I have a son, John, who just got back not very long ago from Paris. So you all may have crossed paths over there. He he, uh, and the the John, what you said is absolutely true, and um, I think our country has certainly 
recognize that. And through World War One and World War Two, um, like you said, we poked fun at our at our friends in France, but but they were a tremendous help in this fledgling country that would not have made it without their help. I don't think, and I think you're correct. I don't think any of those patriots that we so honor now. I don't think they would have been lucky enough to die there, to spend their lives in prison. I think they've all been hanged. Absolutely. I, I will tell you, and the vast majority of my trip was about uh, business development, fundraising, and some work uh, over at the um, with some folks at the U.S. Embassy. And the one thing that I've enjoyed is the majority of the people that I spend time with over there are entrepreneurs, and they're fighting again the exact same battle. They're very frustrated by the government being more of a hindrance than uh, providing any help to their cause. Uh, but there's a significant number of them, and like us on the final say, and you in Congress, they're not uh, they're not giving up easy. They they understand that it's a it's a very close 50-50 battle with the forces of collectivism versus individual liberty, and they're uh, and they're and they're fighting the case every bit as hard as we are, and uh, hopefully we'll both win. Well, we you know we I, I wish that message would get out more. What I understand also is a lot of the uh, young entrepreneurs. Are, are leaving their country, and that is not good. I mean, it is a very bad thing to have, especially the uh, the future of your country. And I think with uh, taxes being what they are, people look smart. People are going to figure out how to avoid that, and if and if avoiding it is is leaving, that's what they'll do. I think I, I think a state. Uh, if you look at around the country. If you look at California, look at New York. What uh, a few decades ago, New York had 50. New York State had uh, your next door neighbor had 54 representatives. Now they have 27. In in relation to where the population go, well, they moved to states like Tennessee, which is rated one of the top three or four states in the union to start a business and on one place to retire. The lowest per capita debt in the country. We balanced the budget in our state last year with cutting taxes during a recovery from a recession. That's what we did with Republican leadership down here, and there is a message for the entire country. That's a pretty good story to tell, and people are hearing it, and they're leaving places like California where you say, okay, if you're very successful here, we'll just tack on another 13% state income tax. Tennessee's figured out how to run the state and improve our education system without an income tax. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. You know, you know, with all the people from New York who left New York, went to New Jersey, and when the people in New Jersey got frustrated, they went further south, and I think it, it just cycles downward. But eventually I wonder if, if Florida ever changes to a too liberal of a state where are those people are going to go. They're gonna, they'll, they'll move back to Tennessee. We were, we had a town hall the other day, and, uh, and the lady sitting next to my wife is that the town hall was from New Jersey. <laughs> she'd, moved, she'd moved here. But of course, I, I'm joke. I mean, it's partially true, but I, I am just kidding with that. Uh, now, Congressman, I, I thought it was very interesting. You had a, a great piece that you entitled "Checks and Balances," and I, I want to relate it to a comment that I heard from the president in his remarks regarding the Zimmerman case. And we don't have to get into the case, but he basically said, you know, we we saw the, the rule of law and, and it must be followed. And so when I'm looking at your press release and and we're discussing here. Obamacare and a health law that that is law and last time I checked when we have laws we're supposed to follow them so I'm wondering how the same president could come out and say if you're an employer that has 50 or more full-time employees we're going to delay the penalties for you but not for everybody else and to me that's not following the law uh, Mr. Congressman well this is this is the pick and choose president, and you know we yes. we choose and and whether whether you want to uh, agree with Doma or not, it was the law of the land. The Supreme Court struck it down. He ignored that. Uh, he ignored this one because it was obvious that that businesses were having a hard time complying. I just spoke to a group of HR directors just a, an hour or so ago, and they're they're scratching their heads about how to implement this very very. In almost impossibly complex bill, and Brett and John, I, I have now for three years studied this bill and have read it and studied it, and every time a new rulemaking comes out, something different happens, and the president doesn't have an option of, of enforcing the law unless it's it, it's inconvenient, like immigration. We just don't we ignore a lot of those laws, but that's not how we are as a country, and that's not why we have a constitution. And uh, clearly, the uh, the D.C. Circuit just said in the uh, NLRB 
case that was brought up before them that what he did was unconstitutional. Was folks that he just put in during a pro forma session of the um, of the of the Senate. So he, he he's picking and choosing. We've never had a president behave quite like this. I don't think. Not that I can recall. Uh, you know, it, you just brought up the immigration, and and that's another thing. You know, here we are. We're arguing for this another massive bill another total reformation of our immigration process. And you just said it yourself. If we're not uh, following the current law, how could we be assured or how could we expect any administration, including especially this one, to follow a new rewrite? So any promises given, how do we know that they're going to follow through? You know, Brett, the thing that I spent uh, a lifetime doing before – uh, four years ago was it was a lot of it was in the operating room and and we had to do a lot of really difficult things to people and they had to trust you to be able to allow them to do the things you had to do and one of the problems we'll have in this country if we don't trust our government to do what it's supposed to do and we're a fair people if you talk to people they queue up and and for the most part we're law-abiding people and that's what we expect everyone else to do and I started my morning off this morning in Greenville Tennessee with a group of Hispanic leaders and, and no one else there but us. And we went from school teachers to farm workers to – and I wanted to hear uh, what was on their mind. And and obeying the law is on their mind. And they, they are law-abiding. Many of them are law-abiding citizens also. And they expect people to do exactly what they have done. And I think that's the problem we have right now with this president. My concern is, is if we – let's say we pass this 1,200-page monstrosity, and by the time it has all the rules written, who knows how many thousands of pages it will be. The question is, will we enforce it once it's done? I think that's the critical question. And in the House, when we had our conference the other day, that was the overriding theme is that, look, we have to get border security, and then we have to enforce it and show people that we're serious about it before any of this other stuff really matters. Well, it's very interesting, uh, Congressman, when you look at – you just pointed out basically that the president is playing a game of compliances in the eyes of the beholder, and we've already seen over recent months, although sadly Congress seems to have dropped the ball on this a bit, is the politicization of so many of our critical government institutions that are supposed to implement uh, uh, the laws – and so what we have now is another bill where you have these law of unintended consequences. When a bill is this complicated, you make one small change, the ramifications could be quite profound. And it feels to me like the president is playing Jenga with a, what is it, one-fifth or one-sixth of America's economy. That worries me. Yes. It keeps me up at Well, and, and, no, you're absolutely right about that, John. And the, and the, the thing that when you're absolutely, when there are all these intertwining parts and one part, if you do this, the other part doesn't work – well, the health care bill is unworkable. I mean, it, it you can delay this for a year. This plan is just not going to work. It won't crash all of a sudden because there's too much money in it to allow that to happen, but it will limp along. And I, I'll tell you, the, the limp is going to get to be a stagger when young people, especially young people, and we've talked about this on the show before, I, I'm more concerned. I, I'm at the age where I shouldn't have 24-year-olds who've just gotten out of college or 25-year-olds trying to buy their first automobile and get their first apartment on their own and all of that should be subsidizing my health insurance. And that's exactly what's happened with this. That's part of the scheme that works. We have to extract money from uh, self-insured plans to make sure that insurance companies are indemnified in the first three years of the plan so the exchanges will work. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. We could talk about all the ramifications of this plan. And you're right. It's like one sp it's not one spoke and the wheel keeps turning. The spokes are attached to each other and the, the, the wheel falls apart. Yeah, I, I look at this in two ways. One is I, I, I don't agree with every law that's made, but I agree with following the law. And I feel if, if we're not going to follow the law, then we may as well get rid of it and, and put something in place that we will follow. But when I look at the process of implementation of Obamacare, it seems to me that there, this isn't the first time we've had to repeal or, or change something in the law. But we're at a point where even major unions are coming out and saying, we're not happy with what's going on here. This, this can't be. We've got to change this. At what point do we get where not just those of us who think the law wasn't constitutional to begin with and it still argue that case, but at what point do the American people just say, you know what? This thing was a bad idea. Let's just repeal it, go back to the drawing board, and come up with something maybe even a little bit smaller, but something that makes sense and is truly lawful. 
Well, Brett, I, I, I agree with you 100%, and I don't know when that is. I just noticed another Gallup poll where the uncertainty about it, the dislike of this, went up again uh, in the last one. And, and if you talk to people, these are HR directors I just left speaking to at noon, and and they – they they don't know what to do in there. They don't know how to advise people when the, what kind of ins what's their insurance going to look like. I can tell you what most of it's going to look like. It's going to you're going to pay more and get less. That's exactly what it's going to look like. And I since you mentioned it, I am the uh, chairman of the uh, health committee on the Republican Study Committee, and I can't go through it all because I haven't presented it to its membership. But I've had a committee meeting uh, once or twice a week now for the last two months. We're within one meeting. Of having an R, it's not a perfect bill, but having an RSC um, uh, replacement bill done. So we're there. The, the, it's 180 pages. We've still got one part of the tax to put in there. Probably about another 50 pages, maybe. Uh, it, it'll be under 250 page bill that will essentially do the same thing without tax increases. And it doesn't do anything with Medicare or Medicaid. This is strictly on the private side. It will increase coverage. It will be market-centered, I mean market-driven, patient-centered. And when we get it finished, I would be delighted to come on and go over it with everybody. And, and if we can repeal this monstrosity and put something like this a little bit, not nearly as expansive, a lot easier to understand uh, for people. I, I think uh, some tweaking of the system needed to be done. There's no question about that. But we didn't need this wholesale revision. We've got very good doctors looking for the exit signs at their hospital now, and that's a bad thing. Well, we have consistently heard that from doctors across the land, including family members and friends. So I want to touch on something you brought up, which I think is very important. You touched on the job issue, and uh, the uh, basically risk capital is where you create jobs, and capital at risk is looking always for the reasons why not to invest. What are the risk factors? Every new unknown inserted into the equation is another hindrance towards job growth. Have you or, or have you seen or have uh, have you been involved in any research in the last year that has looked at the impact of uh, forget whether Obamacare is right or wrong, but the impact of its implementation on what it's uh, what it's doing to uh, job growth? Anything quantitative or qualitative worth sharing? It is. You know, well, this morning one of our Hispanic leaders brought up, he said, uh, he said every businessman wants to grow his business. He said with this uh, Obamacare plan, it may be too expensive to grow. So it's, it's, it's absolutely doing this. We looked at the jobs report about how many parts. That was absolutely predictable. And the, the uh, hearings that I've held as, as a chairman of the Health, the Health, Employment, Labor, and Pension subcommittee around the country – we brought small businesses in to talk to us about how does this bill, how does this law affect your business. And every single one of them to the person has said it will limit their ability to create jobs. That is exactly the opposite of what you want to do to get out of this terrible funk we've been in for the past four and a half years. So you know, when you have a businessman say, I'm not going to grow my business because it will cost me money to do it, I'm in business to make money. So you're hearing that all over the place. I think the jobs data is now beginning to – look, the biggest uh, agency in the country, other than the federal government, as I read, was were temporary agencies. And one of these one of these businessmen ran a, a um, job placement agency, and he's, his business is booming right now. He's about to wear the E-Verify machine off and because people are hiring part-time work. Let me give you a personal example of this, and I won't mention which – restaurant just for privacy but there's a restaurant chain if i mentioned it a lady in there that we know that waits on me when i go in there i've known her for a long time she takes care of me when i go in and serves my uh, breakfast and she is divorced she has to make it on her own she's working hard tips are hard to come by they call her in and said look because of this plan we're going to have to cut your hours from 40 hours a week down to 29 hours a week because we can't afford in the restaurant business to do this. So here is a divorced woman taking care of herself in her 50s who is having to now find a second job, and she'll go on the jobs report as a new job created. No, this is a person that had a full-time job, has now got to work two part-time jobs to pay her bills. So she loses a full week of work a month because of this. And she had health insurance at the time, a policy that would not qualify is adequate coverage under the new definition of the law. That's happened. I've talked. That's happened right here. That's a fantastic point that you brought up. 
and and what you just said about counting on the roles as an additional job created when we know it isn't, I could imagine if we looked over the entire roster of workers, how many times people are double or triple or maybe even more counted. So how how can we really depend on a true employment number right now? Well, you can't, and it's not the way you grow an economy with part-time work. We've never. I think no. that's one of the reasons it's been a drag, uh, Brett and John, on. Look, the, the deeper you go into a recession, I've looked at all of them since 19, the Depression in the 30s. You typically come out very quickly. The curve out is very steep. This one's been a grind to get out, and it may be 2016 before we're back at employment numbers of 2008. It may take us that many years to get back, eight years to get back where we were. That's not an American recovery. That, that's a European no, and it, it, recovery. And like you said, it's a first in modern economic history. Well, Congressman, it's been a pleasure having you. We thank you so much for your time, and uh, we wish you uh, well there in Washington, D.C., and also back in, in Tennessee. Again, thank Thanks you so very much. much. All right, take care. That's uh, Congressman Phil Rowe, and you could find him at Rowe, that's R-O-E dot house dot gov, and you could follow uh, all that he's doing and uh, great work, uh, and 